Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will continue to celebrate Pride Month by discussing the work of Centerlink with special guests, Denise Spivak, uh, Executive Director of Centerlink, and Robert Boo, Co-Chair of the Board at Centerlink and Executive Director of the Pride Center at Equity Park in South Florida. So thank you very much for joining us, Denise. Thank you, Robert. And, and you know, I just want to set you up. I'm going to, I'm going to go to you, Denise. CenterLeak uh, is an international organization, and it's, uh, it's an association of LGBTQ plus community centers and other right. organizations with over 270 members. And uh, I was uh, interviewing Diego Sanchez of PFLAG the other day, and when I asked him about the state of LGBTQ plus rights, he answered, well, it depends on your zip code. And it seems the community okay. centers, they're zip code based. So could you just give us a state of, of affairs in terms of the community centers and how they have navigated COVID and, and where they stand today uh, coming out of this pandemic? Absolutely. And, and I'm so glad you interviewed Diego. I love him. Uh, he's one of my favorite people. So yeah, Amazing guy. Amazing he really is. Guy. He's done a, a, amazing things at PFLAG too. So Community centers uh, have done a phenomenal job of navigating uh, the pandemic, and uh, it, it's at, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, and, and we were talking about this before we, we went live, um, I think for everybody, it was this pause of, well, what are we going to do now? Like, I, what's our next move? And for community centers that are walk-in facilities that, that provide on-site services, it, it, it was really, how do we not leave our community behind? How do we provide that same support and, and those same resources without opening our doors? And um, so we opened our virtual doors and our community centers pivoted on a dime. They learned how to use Zoom. Um, our youth centers learned how to use things like Discord. Um, our a program that we have that we do with the community centers called Q Chat Space, which is a virtual program. Um, it, it, they they all exploded, and people. It was everything from figuring out how to do those online support sessions so that they still gave that same sort of support, and also in some cases having to teach people how to use the technology in order to be able to use that support. So, aside from that, a lot of our centers. It expanded their clothing closets. They started food pantry programs if they didn't already have them. For the centers that, that did medical uh, programs, whether it was HIV testing or, um, or in-person medical uh, services, they, they had to figure out how to do those. So it was, in some cases, pre-scheduled one person at a time, nobody else in the building. So it was really a, a tour de force for our centers to figure out how to how to be that same heart of the community, but do it in a very different way. It's kind of a teachable moment, isn't it? A crisis sort of brings people together. Robert, when you take a look at community centers and you, you run a community center, um, you have been in this movement for a long time. Could you talk a little bit about the functions and the changing functions of, of the community centers within different communities. How do you experience um, uh, the needs of the community and how do you serve the community in different ways? Sure. So the each community center is very unique. Out of the 270, there's probably not one that is an exact copy of another one because it does depend on the zip code of what services programs, what other service providers are in that area. So for example, we're very fortunate. I'm located in Wilton Manors, which is Fort Lauderdale, South Florida. Um, so we are not an uh, aid service organization because there are other organizations, sister organizations in our community that provide that. So it doesn't make sense for us to duplicate the service or try to take funding when funding is already so tight. It doesn't make sense to take that funding away, try to fight for it for, for someone else's sister organization. So each community center has to look at what are the gaps in their community. And again, we consider ourselves Switzerland. We get along with everyone. We collaborate with everyone. 
we uh, link people to resources and services within the community that we don't pr provide directly. And so um, that's why each community center is very unique. We have the LA Center, which is the largest LGBT organization in the world that provides everything. Right. And then we have other organizations, other centers that are servicing small rural communities. And so their program, their footprint, their look is gonna be very different. So let's let's traverse this this world. If you're if you're talking in a small community, um, and where there are not that many services, there are a number of different um, uh, elements that uh, generally will comprise a community center. There's this um, th there's the issue of having a safe space, safe emotionally, away from trauma, away from lack of acceptance, uh, finding acceptance. Right. Then there's the whole issue of information exchange. You mentioned, Robert, that you don't provide uh, AIDS services, um, but other um, organizations do. Right. What other in the small uh, community centers that are remote outside of, of urban centers, uh, Denise, what kind of uh, service patterns do you see in those uh, institutions? You know, again, Mark, as, as Robert said, there's there's really no one footprint. Um, rural areas are a lot harder to navigate, um, you know, to, to even put up a building that would say, or, or a, an office that would say LGBT on the window in some places can be a very frightening thing. Um, and potentially no one would come. Um, right. So in those cases, it might be that they have an office somewhere. They might uh, be located in a church basement um, or, or in the back of a um, of another facility where it's, it, you know, it's not always so much about the building, it's about the services. So in, in a lot of cases, rural centers are doing a lot of work with schools. Um, they're doing a lot of work trying to find medical providers who will provide services to the LGBT community. So it really, it, it, it depends on the, the location. There are other rural areas where they do have a, a location and, and they do events and they do prides. Um, it, it just really, it's gonna depend on, on safety and, and the whole atmosphere, if you will, of, of the uh, lo locale. Well, you're pointing out, you're making a really important point. If you take a look at the traditional concept of a community center, community centers were basically social gathering points. But when it comes to the LGBTQ plus movement, right? You've got here a, a, a political issue. You have a safety issue. You have um, a um, dealing with, with, uh, with uh, shame and stigma uh, issue. It's self-identity issues, right? You have a much more complicated uh, operating environment than uh, a YMCA does or, or uh, some uh, community center in a sense um, you have to think about a lot more um, when you decide to, um, to set up a community center. And so your, the character is different. How do you staff, Robert, in terms of when you look as, as the chair of the board, as you look at your, your, uh, your fellow uh, center directors, do you find that that character creates uh, different competencies that need to be embedded in these organizations in order to serve the community adequately? Absolutely, because when you look at the LGBT community, it really is one of the broadest communities across the whole spectrum of race, religion, gender identity, sexual orientation, um, the whole gamut. So um, we're a very diverse group, age, youth versus active agers. We, we don't call them seniors because now that I'm one, we're, we're active agers. Um, so our, our programs, our environment that we provide uh, for that safe space looks very different depending upon where you are. Here in South Florida, I'm very fortunate. Wilton Manors is the second gayest city per capita in the United States. I realize that I'm in a bubble, but if I go to Iowa or you know some rural area, my whole uh, portfolio of services and the whole look and how out 
we may be is going to look totally different. It's, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, the, the, uh, the point that you're making is that uh, even if you're talking about cultural reference points, right, depending on where you live, uh, where you're located, the cultural reference points can be incredibly diverse because um, orientation doesn't run um, according to a particular culture or religion or a particular race or a particular age uh, or whatever, right? So what you're trying to do is you're trying to satisfy the needs across uh, a broad cultural landscape. Uh, Denise, when you look at uh, the leadership that you have, does, does the uh, leadership, the staff, does it reflect that diversity uh, in society? We see so many institutions that are and, and we're having a reckoning in this country, white dominated or male dominated or whatever. Um, how do you, uh, as you as you look across the board landscape and the and the staff landscape, are there changes that are required in order to meet the the needs of the moment? There are changes that are necessary, um, but I would say that uh, that the changes are probably one one of the larger challenges that that our centers face, um, and and I would probably argue that. We're not alone in this in the nonprofit world, but um, you know, boards still tend to be about 60, 65% white. Um, the really the staff is is probably the most reflective level of the community. Uh, but once we move into leadership, and, and I'm happy to say the tide is turning on that as well. We're starting to see many more leaders um, representing different. Uh, races and, and communities, um, but but the, we still have a challenge here. We still have a challenge with, with leadership and board leadership um, to, to be truly reflective of our communities, and, and we're working on it. Incidentally, we just completed a poll, and this is a rather select group. Um, uh, only a third of the uh, individuals who responded to this poll uh, said that they've been involved with uh, any community um, at, at LGBTQ plus community center. Are you finding that recruiting people to uh, join your community, Robert, is at all a challenge? And, and Denise, are you finding that that uh, we're getting to the point where in urban centers, the, um, the, the situation has shifted so much that uh, an LGBTQ plus community center is no longer the value proposition that it was earlier? How do you see it, Robert? Well, I'm, I'm smiling because I remember very specifically when marriage equality was passed, people that were physically around me were like, oh, okay, now our work is done. And I actually had one of my donors look at me and said, well, I just don't think, you know, LGBT community centers are going to be needed in the future because we just got marriage equality and now everything is wonderful and rosy. And I looked at him and I went, really? So all of those JCCs, all of those African-American community centers, all, you know, it went down the long list, said people will always want to be able to have a safe space with individuals, like-minded individuals. And just because we got marriage equality doesn't mean all of the work that we have to do goes away. And then all of our community members, your question about recruiting um, community members to, to be involved in, in centers, I can speak specifically for me. We service thousands, over 35,000 people a year on our campus pre-COVID. We would have one to 2,000 people step foot on our campus on a daily basis. So um, we're, we're very fortunate. We have uh, five buildings, 35,000 square feet of meeting and office space. And at night, that office space is filled. Those meeting rooms are filled with groups, organizations um, that go the whole gamut of support groups, social groups, um, activities, political groups, um, the ballet and opera club. Um, you know, it's a whole gamut of um, brothers speak. So people still want to get together. They still want to congregate. They still want that safe space. Um, and like I said, we're very fortunate to have the five and a half acre campus that we do, but that's not common. So you're, you're a service provider to other nonprofits and to other uh, organizations in your community. 
Correct. When we purchased our five and a half acre campus back in 2009, our concept was to create a campus of care, multiple services, multiple organizations. So someone could come onto our campus and see a number of service providers. It wasn't just about us. And Denise, as, as you look at other uh, organizations, are you finding that, that the uh, that the centers are also functioning as alliance builders with other nonprofit organizations, with other members of the communities, very very uh, frequent and, and service providers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the the centers are, are not only hubs for the community, but but often are hubs. Um, or I should say not just for community members, but often for the community as a whole. Um, and even even in some states, not even communities. I mean, we have centers that are often the only LGBT representation in the entire state. So so they are are building alliances throughout the state um, to provide awareness and services. Um, so and, and I will say during COVID, it, in in many cases, it was the centers that were still doing things that were still providing for the community when other agencies were not able to. So um, so it, through COVID possibly even more so than they, than they always are. Do you find that through these alliances, you're able to uh, extend your programs and services uh, out further than you would if you were acted solo? I, I, I can say yes at the national level. Um, and we spend a lot of time working with partner agencies to, to provide programming opportunities, uh, sign-on opportunities, advocacy app opportunities. Um, and, and I'll let Robert talk to, to more of the local level. Sure, and in our particular case, um, well, with COVID, by the second week, we shut down March 18th of 2020, and by the second week, we took everything virtual. And we have the nation's largest weekly gathering of LGBT active agers. And so it actually expanded, going virtual expanded our reach. So. We would have like over 200 active agers every Tuesday morning in tender program. But when we went virtual, we were having thousands of people from all over the country watch our Facebook live events. And so we switched to four days a week doing Facebook live updates. Um, you know, every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, every Wednesday during the pandemic, what's behind me is the state of Florida's first uh, LGBT focused um, uh, senior affordable and supportive housing. And so construction was deemed essential. And so I physically gave updates and walking tours every Wednesday so people could see the progress that was still going on because people were starving for good news because we were all hunkered down. We were all scared, nervous about what was going on. We didn't know how it was being transmitted at first. And so this was a way to still stay connected to the community, let them know that the work was still going on and, and then see some good news, know that this was still going on. When these community centers started up um, and, and they, they go back uh, 30, 40 years. 50. Um, 50 years. 50. Thank you, thank you for the correction. Sure. So, <laughs> so they, they started off, you know, it was a bunch of young folks. Now, we're talking about a much more diverse audience. Uh, how does your, uh, your constituencies uh, skew in terms of uh, age ranges? I, I, I can speak nationally and I, I can say it again, depends where you are. We, we have uh, centers that are solely youth focused. Um, and then we have centers that, um, that span all age ranges. Um, you know, interestingly enough, you're talking about the history of centers that the original LGBT community centers were bars. Um, they were the place that people gathered and found safe space and support and, and camaraderie. Um, and, and out of that were, was born the first center, which is the Los Angeles Center, um, followed by, by so many after that. But um, I, I think you know, it, it, the, the biggest thing that, that we tell people who want to start centers is to do the community needs assessment to find out who wants needs and will support a center. Um, and so for that reason, it will depend with each center who they focus on, what their constituency really will be. Um, and, and really, our centers serve those in need. Um, and, and 
primarily LGBT, but if somebody shows up on the doorstep, there, there's no test. We don't ID them. I mean, we, we, we serve people who need to be served. So we just completed a poll and we, we asked what are the greatest needs among members of the LGBTQ plus community? And um, it, interesting, we had uh, uh, the same number of people who said no different from other communities. And then we had um, uh, a response of uh, support for advocacy um, and advocacy for uh, legal rights. The largest uh, group of responders said counseling and tactical support in dealing with society's dysfunction. Um, Robert, let's talk about the last, uh, the last element, uh, dealing with society's dysfunction. I mean, the whole issue of having one person not accepting another person for whoever they are, uh, for whatever, whatever basis, right? Race, gender, orientation. Um, it just seems to me to be uh, kind of incomprehensible. Um, when you look at those kinds of programs where you're, where you're helping um, uh, to change how people interact. Um, how do you uh, create intersectionality at your center? Well, I'm just gonna use a very recent and timely um, situation that just occurred here in the state of Florida. The governor just signed, and it's the 12th state in the country to sign an anti-trans sports bill. And it's now a law in Florida preventing young girls and women from competing in um, uh, sports in grade school, middle school, high school, and college. So we are in essence now, the state is telling any trans youth that they cannot be their authentic self, that they are less than everyone else, that they can't compete in sports, and they either have to go stealth and hide their true uh, authentic self or have to give up sports altogether. Now, so, is, it just, is it just people transitioning in, in one direction or is it, by, is it either way? Well, this particular law was for trans girls, trans women. And even though they were citing a case that was in Connecticut, and there was only 12 known cases in the state of Florida, they, why waste the time and effort to put in a law that hasn't been an issue? We're, these are children. Well, it's, it's, it's creating stigma, right? Yes, absolutely. That's basically what's going on. If there's not a problem, it's, it's basically sending a signal. And so if there, and what is the signal that can be sent, right? It, it's basically yeah, and creating, it, creating stigma. It's the first law, first time in 27 years that Florida passed that was anti-LGBT. So it's like we're taking a step back. So how do you how do you deal with that um, from from the center's perspective? You're in Florida, uh, you're seeing this this law. We were talking about intersectionality. How how do how do you create the awareness uh, amongst people who don't really think about this issue on a daily basis? Um, right. So it does require getting the whole community, the, all the L's, the B's, um, the G's, all together to help support our brothers and sisters of trans and non-binary um, uh, uh, existence. So we have to build that support. We have to provide that safe space and let them know that we are here to back them up, to be a part of the fight here and be visible because trans youth may not be able to be visible. So those of us that can, we need to be there. We need to be out there. We need to build the allies. And overwhelmingly, people are opposed to these, these type of laws. It is strictly at the upper level of lawmakers that are making these decisions for so red meat to their base. Is what you're saying is that as, as safety increases for someone who is gay or uh, lesbian, you know, the L, G, G, the Bs, as you, as, you, uh, as you point out, and for people like me, right? I'm, I'm hetero, right? So um, is, is what is required that, that we become 
um, educators and advocates. And if, and if we are now safe, uh, whether uh, we're safe as someone who is black or a woman or uh, someone who is Jewish or whatever, we become um, engaged in, in this idea of making it safe for others. Is, is, is that, is that uh, basically the point uh, here, Robert? Correct, because once they start chipping away and going af after the marginalized communities, it will continue to grow and erode. And um, uh, I'm trying to remember the, uh, the pre preacher's name. I, when I went through Yad Vashem in, in uh, uh, Israel, you know, first they came for this group and I did nothing. And then they came for this group and I did nothing. And then they came to me and for me and no one was there to protect me. So we've got to be there to protect because it's going to erode and, and start taking back the equality that everyone should have. Yeah, it was Martin Niemöller and he was, a, Thank you. He, was he was an anti-Semite. And then he, he, he saw what was going on. Denise, do you find that in, in the greater uh, group of 270 organizations that are part of uh, Centerlink that this sensibility is, is dominant or is this something that only a few people believe? Oh, well, no, I, absolutely. And, and you know, just by virtue of being an LGBT organization, we are advocates. Um, but, the, but the important thing for, for us to remember, you know, Robert, touched on this at the very beginning was that we intersect virtually every other community and and so we have a population of people that not only face one oppression or, or marginalization they face multiple in many right. cases um and so it, it's so important for us to be aware not only within the lgbtq plus community but also within the African-American community, within the Asian-American community. Um, you know, trans women of color are murdered at, 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 at I mean, a rate that is so far higher than, than any other group. And it's, it's something that, that all of our centers are, are, are having to, to not only, you know, commemorate the, the, the people that, that have passed, that, that have been murdered, um, but, but to make everybody aware that this is happening, to, to make everybody aware, as Robert was saying, of, of inequality, legal inequality. So it, it's, it's constant education, it's constant awareness, um, and, and that hopefully starts to turn minds and hearts and, and change the tide. And if you look at it, it's not pol uh, politics at all. It's really about a civil society. What kind of America do we want to have? And you know, there needs to be room for people. Let's say, let's say, I really, really, really did not believe in in um, in uh, people who have a different orientation than me. Right. The real question is, can I accept it? Can I basically respect the ideas? Um, that people can be different. And I think that, that just talking about this type of topic here today is, is so important. I'd like to thank you both um, uh, for uh, helping us to understand uh, the world of uh, community centers. Um, Denise, uh, thank you so much for sharing your work as the executive director of Centerlink and Robert, uh, your work as the chair uh, and um, and uh, the head of the uh, Pride Center at Equality uh, Park. It's just invaluable for you to unpack a little bit uh, for us. Denise, can you just see us out? What do you want this uh, these organizations uh, to achieve over the next couple of years um, as, as we look into the future? Just, you know, continuing to provide that, that safe, welcoming space for their communities. And, and that means their whole communities, um, and that hopefully we do increase awareness. We uh, we do help to to change hearts and minds and and create a, a better society. Robert, you want to weigh in? Uh, just to duplicate what Denise said is, we are there to provide that safe space so everyone can be their authentic self and not have to hide, not have to worry about stigma, 
shame, guilt, et cetera. How about an objective of relaxed equality? Thank you so much. Everybody have a great day. Thank you attendees for coming and helping out and, uh, and everyone stay safe. Take care.